Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you had a fantastic Easter break and enjoyed the, the warm weather, albeit I'm still in the lockdown, obviously, for most parts of the world. Uh, but hopefully you managed to make the most of it. Um, as you can see here, uh, a lot of you might be watching this video in the end on YouTube. Uh, so don't forget to like and subscribe to the video and the channel. Uh, very much appreciate it if we can grow our community. Uh, and obviously every day I encourage people to any questions that they have, any market opinions that you have, just leave a comment. I'll be replying throughout the day as I always do, as will the rest of the team. So happy to in engage with you guys and answer your questions as much as possible. Um, one of the things here as well that I've received quite a lot of messages, there was a video that went out in the US about a week ago of which uh, I appeared on a panel discussion uh, with someone you might recognize as a name, Mike Bellafiore, uh, but he and I were giving a chat just generally about just what traders look at and how do we monitor news. That was kind of my, my part of the discussion. And so a lot of people have been asking me about how to use Twitter uh, for trading and so on. So if you go on our YouTube channel, uh, this video here, you can see down at the bottom how to use Twitter, picture myself there. Uh, if you click on that video, that's basically your, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know. Uh, so yeah, do, do check that out when you get time if you've not seen it before. Uh, but otherwise, let's just have a quick look at what's going on this morning. And overall, uh, a little bit of risk appetite. Obviously, America were back in the market yesterday. Uh, we're going to have a look through some of the charts to just see uh, the lay of the land going into today's session. Because of course, you've probably read US earnings season kicks off today. Uh, which is going to be a bit of a focal point, of course, uh, just given the context of the overall economic environment to ascertain how severely yet uh, corporate profitability has been impacted by the shutdown and COVID-19. Um, but OPEC deal, obviously, that was the where we left things at the end of last week. Uh, we'll have a catch up on that. But overall, this morning, um, equity index futures up, generally positive. Uh, Dow up about 300, the S&P 33 points, and the DAX about 165. Uh, so fixed income a touch lower, albeit just bumping up a little bit in the last half an hour, still down two and a half ticks in the 10-year. Uh, and then gold uh, still elevated up $8, albeit off the natural resistance of R1 that we had following the grind up in yesterday's session. We'll have a look at gold as well in a bit more detail. The currency markets, the, the Dixie's pretty flat, albeit uh, it's just come up a little bit um, in more recent trade to test an area of support in the Dixie from yesterday evening, uh, London time. So both major pairs just coming off a, a, a touch, but still up on the day at the moment. Eurodollar up 4.5, cable up 16 for the time being. WTI crew down at the bottom here, pretty much sideways action. Uh, as I said, we'll, we'll review that in a moment, but obviously still digesting whether or not the market's going to be satisfied with this OPEC plus deal and G20 that they managed to uh, kind of club together a few days ago. So what have we got to look out for? And, and generally, why is there positive risk on sentiment uh, at the moment? Well, uh, there was some data overnight, um, data showing Chinese exports in yuan terms fell less than expected. This helped kind of lift sentiment a little bit, in, at least in the short term. Um, I would say that's generally quite a short-term reaction though. I don't think there's going to be particularly long-lasting, uh, but Asia up a little bit overnight. Uh, the export number for China was minus 6.6%. Sounds pretty bad, but expectations were for minus 14%. Um, and then Overall, continued easing in the rate of new infections in many countries in regards to coronavirus, um, which is something we can review as well. Uh, but overall, in terms of the week ahead, this is what we're looking at if I transition my screen. Um, earning season, as I said, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second, but the big banks are always the first to report, so today no different. We get JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and also Johnson & Johnson going to kick things off. Um, there's about 40 S&P 500 companies this week, uh, including four of the Dow 30 components. Um, later on in the week, we get Citi, Bank of America, BlackRock, Goldman, so all of these kind of top-tiered U.S. banks. Um, as we go through the week, Wednesday could be quite interesting. U.S. retail sales obviously poised to fall in March by the most ever seen, just given the immediacy of the uh, the lockdown, and that's going to have a severe impact on the retail sector, of course, not just in America, uh, 
uh, but in terms of globally, but obviously this is going to be uh, quite a key reading, kind of like what we've been looking with jobless claims. We know it's going to be bad. We know it's going to be extremely elevated record high levels of initial jobless. It's just how far is that? You know, how bad is it? And, and I guess we'll be looking at retail sales in a similar fashion. And then on Friday, we've got China releasing its GDP numbers. Uh, and that comes alongside then the slew of data they always release at the same time as GDP. IP, retail sales, and their jobless figure as well, all coming on Friday. Uh, but let's just have a quick review then on the coronavirus cases. And this is what I was gonna look at first, which if I just make this chart this big, so you can see it. Uh, this is looking at uh, daily confirmed cases, a seven day rolling average. Uh, by a number of days since 30 daily cases have been first recorded. Uh, just to refresh your memory, the stars indicate each country's line when the lockdowns were put into place. And as you can see here, uh, a couple of, you know, kind of lukewarm signs that perhaps we're getting to a point where uh, the worst might be over. I know I don't want to jinx things too much but you can see from the trajectory of these lines so even though deaths in certain areas are still incredibly high particularly in America and the UK overall in mainland Europe Italy reported lower number of new coronavirus cases on Monday uh, even as their daily fatalities did rise uh, Britain should expect the number of daily deaths from coronavirus to continue to rise uh, this week unfortunately uh, followed by a plateau for a period of two to three weeks, according to the chief scientific advisor to the government. Um, that has led then to reports, as you can see here, that one, uh, the UK is likely to announce the lockdown extension this week. Uh, according to the Times newspaper, uh, unfortunately, if you are based in the UK, it's looking likely that we're going to remain in lockdown until the 7th of May, uh, is what they're saying. So this fits in step with what we're kind of looking at with these curves is that the UK you can see here is still yet to get to that plateau point and when it does it doesn't decrease immediately we're looking at around a two week period or two to three week before it then starts to drop off and that's when they can look to start loosening some of these measures as what we've seen with Spain um, Spain became the first of the one of the hardest hit European countries to loosen its regulations uh, allowing workers in non-essential industries such as construction, they've returned to work now. Uh, and obviously, much like we were talking about China a few weeks ago, I think this is quite critical now about just monitoring how does that type of um, loosening of these, these these more stringent rules about the you know potential for a secondary wave of transmission of you know human to human contact, how does that pan out in terms of these numbers? Uh, as this is the the, the kind of new difficulty of which the markets have got to face as a challenge now. Um, a few other things then uh, in terms of these, these dates, what we're looking at. So as I said, UK is going to be extended likely um, what's the date that's being put around is the 7th of, of May. Uh, Italy's new coronavirus cases fall as daily death toll rises, as I said. But Italy, we already know that theirs has been extended to the 3rd of May. Um, the French President Macron came out at the weekend and said they're going to extend to the 11th of May. India to the 3rd of May has been another one that's come out earlier this morning. Um, and then in the US. Now, the US, of course, um, has now jumped to the top of the par in terms of um, the severity of the situation of COVID-19. But Trump has made some comments over the weekend, excuse me, yesterday on Monday, uh, and said that the administration was close to completing a plan to reopen the US economy, including nine states on the US East Coast and West Coast, which are uh, predominantly the hardest hit when it comes to the virus in, in North America. Uh, so I'm not too sure how to interpret this, to be honest, because the the situation is still fairly severe and i would say that they've still got another period of uh, of probably quite high levels until we start to see a decrease in the lights of say italy and france who generally are slightly ahead of the curve um so i can understand why trump would say this type of thing he's obviously a little bit of management uh, given the negative situation that we're seeing in the empirical evidence of the us economy whether through um, you know, layoffs, jobless claims being at these multi, you know, kind of weekly record highs. The retail sales this week's going to be a disaster. GDP's coming up in Q2 is going to be, 
you know, massively down. And so I guess he's he's trying to sound positive in a sense that the sooner we can get things open, the sooner he can kind of jolt the economy back to life again. But obviously it comes at a real uh, health risk. So as much as he's saying this, how much is this deliverable? Well, again, I think he's being a little bit optimistic here. Remember when we were delivering the briefing a few weeks ago, he said that the US economy would be open by Easter. Well, Easter's come and Easter's gone and they're still in lockdown. So what politicians say and actually what becomes reality, I think a little bit disconnected to be, to be quite frank. So one, one to monitor, but I don't think this is, this is a big deal at this point. Um, this was, you know, looking at, projected timelines and milestones for a return to work in the US. Um, if you did want to look at this in more detail, I did tweet it. Um, my handle, of course, is here, so just feel free to follow me on, on Twitter. I'm fairly active these days now that I'm at home rather than in the office. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit small to look at. I'll let you digest that in your own time, but essentially it was looking at uh, what I thought from Morgan Stanley, quite a nice analysis of the general bottom axis which is kind of here we're right in the middle of this blue peak uh, and the way they've kind of this is a cumulative value of the uh, daily new cases in the east and west coast uh, coupled with the rest of the US with case numbers over 1000 then it's looking at the general trend lower as we go through the coming months until schools reopen which is timetabled for kind of September time and then the potential second wave of infections, but the potential vaccine for health workers, when does that come? And then when does the potential vaccine broadly become available for the general public, which MS uh, in their research are suggesting is not gonna be until basically 12 months time, um, essentially. So yeah, have a, have a look at that when you get a moment. Um, one of the other things though, um, what people have been looking at is obviously the US equity market. Um, this was a comment, a research note out of Goldman Sachs yesterday, and Goldman's have made a bit of an about turn on their previous call. They were, they were previously quite bearish, saying that the market was going to see another pullback of an aggressive nature down to the kind of 2000 level. However, they've now dropped that call and they've actually switched it. And now they're now saying US stocks are likely bottomed on policy support. Despite the likely steady stream of weak earnings reports, Q1 earnings season will not represent a major negative catalyst for equity market performance. Their year-end S&P 500 target remains 3,000 is what they're saying. And on that note, then, let's just get the S&P 500 up and let's have a look at what, we're, what we've got. Um, so let me just quickly switch my screens. So this is the S&P 500. Um, I've just made a couple of markups here from where we were on the reopening of trade. We did kind of gap up, but then came un immediately under pressure, kind of tracking the oil move if you were looking at markets on Sunday night and electronic trade. Uh, we did rally up into the open on Wall Street, but a little bit of nervousness perhaps going into the earnings season, but we've already taken back uh, that move for the moment. But on a slightly longer picture, let's look at that Goldman Sachs call of what they're looking at for the year-end target of 3,000. So 3,000 puts us up basically around this kind of level here, pretty much where you've got that death cross uh, just on my chart here at the moment in terms of these technical indicators. Uh, so you know, not the most outrageous call, uh, and I guess that's the year-end call, so there's probably going to be some ebb and flow of movement until we get to that point. Uh, not forgetting as well that we have got a, you know, it's almost hard to remember, we've got a US election in November at the end of the year, only a few months time. And obviously Trump's going to be doing his utmost to get the US stock market back up there, the economy back reopened in time for that event. Uh, because you know, as we've seen before, he's kind of weaponized the stock market as in order to validate the kind of effectiveness of his policies. So definitely he'll be doing everything, everything he can uh, at that point. Uh, but from Goldman's, their, their general idea here is that just given the, the fiscal and also the kind of unprecedented nature of doing whatever it takes from a monetary policy pers perspective, that has now eliminated the risk of any severe um, downside and, and hence their, their call at the moment. Technically speaking, where we are at the moment, you can see around this 50% fib from the all-time high to the March 23rd low is causing a little bit of resistance for the moment we've really failed to substantially get above that level and that was that summer of 2019 uh, low also the 2800 handle uh, is around these levels so 
that's kind of the obstacle at the moment to the upside. Uh, whether or not we can break above there is going to be quite key. And if we did, the next move up would be up to around that 28.55 type level you can see from the Feb uh, and March areas of significance and also from uh, back on the 4th of October you can see here of 2019. Um, so that's the kind of S&P story and what the chart looks like technically. Um, I'm going to switch over and have a quick look at another chart which is just above it, which is this one which is gold and I was going to change gold to this one which is a monthly chart now someone was asking me this uh, on one of the YouTube comments um, last week about you know where could gold go from here and one of the, the things I responded with was just keeping an eye technically on these much longer time frames is looking at monthly candlesticks and you can see just the incredible move that we've had over the course of April um, even as stock markets have stabilized, one thing to be aware of is this, which is holdings in the SPDR gold shares have surged to their highest since 2013. Uh, now, the SPDR gold shares is the largest such fund, uh, surging above 1,000, as you can see here. So getting above that high that we had in 2016, back to levels not seen uh, for several years. So people still want exposure to gold at this point, despite the general positives that I've been discussing with the, uh, the kind of flatlining, if you like, of the, the, the trajectory of some of the new virus cases. People are still kind of positioning themselves against the economic reality that's still yet to really hit home in full force. Uh, and so with gold, what I was looking at was that 1722, which was up here, that deck 12 kind of high, now that we've got above there, you can see we've pushed a decent $25 already above that level. I wouldn't really expect much in the way of resistance now until we get um, up to around really the $1,800 handle. Um, you can see here where we are at the moment at 55, that does coincide with the November uh, kind of high on the monthly candlestick. Uh, but anything above that then 1800 is the next psychological target and you can see what an important level that is. Um, if I just switch back to my charts here, um, you can see the November 11, Feb, October 12 highs all reside at around that level, kind of 1795, 1800 uh, on the figure uh, to be to be watched. So yeah, going to be it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's kind of a counterintuitive move in a way because you would think as equities continue to move higher, things start to stabilize generally in volatility that you'd think gold would come back down under pressure. But I think it's more of a a positioning play now for what is to come over the coming quarters um, when it comes to, to gold uh, in that respect from a, from a fund manager's point of sense or point of view I should say. Um, the other thing then to, to look at of course is, is oil. Uh, this is just a summary from a tweet I did a few days ago when the initial news was coming out. Uh, OPEC plus they eventually managed to get a deal together. It was looking very last minute. I'm not sure if you were tracking the news over the weekend, but the markets were going to reopen. We're only a few hours to go. They still hadn't got a deal done. And then they called a, a final emergency meeting where they managed to get this thing over the line. So OPEC Plus are going to cut 9.7 million barrels per day for May, June. And Mexico are to cut just 100,000. That's less than its pro rata share. And how this is going to work is that the Americans, Trump, was going to backstop the 300,000 shortfall to hit the 400K that Saudis wanted in order to get the deal uh, over the line, which was, of course, quite interesting, uh, just given the fact, you know, the, the current relationship we've had ever since Trump came into the White House with Mexico. And here he is then backstopping some of their agreement, talking about he would he would cover them, basically, uh, for Mexico then to reconsider in two months time. How this will work, the 9.7 million will be in effect for May, June. And then generally it scales down a little bit as we go further forward in time. But this deal could well be in place for the next two years. Uh, is what they're saying, which is uh, probably the, the the right thing and, and shouldn't come as too much of a surprise when you think about the uh, the kind of the huge impact that the COVID-19 has had and this gradual recovery that we're going to see in the economy. It's not going to be an immediate uh, fix here in terms of what they're doing. It's a much more longer play than that. Um, there were talks of a 3.2 million barrel per day cut from G20 states outside OPEC plus. So this was according to sources at the time, but this is the type of levels that we're looking at. That's a little bit of a disappointment. OPEC plus originally had asked these other G20 states to contribute about five and they've only come through with a low uh, three million. So I was quite bearish at the time when I was hearing this news and 
when we were uh, and the, when, well, first of all let's look at the chart when we were looking at this uh, and I go back to well let's go back to this chart here uh, this was of course uh, the end of last week and wow, just what a what a session it was there was just headlines coming and, and price movement we were seeing big swings of kind of six seven percent ten percent at some periods um, and then we got to the point of Sunday night and we actually opened up just short of twenty five dollars but we came under immediate selling pressure and we pretty much sold off a, a straight ten percent in the first kind of half an hour of trade or so before then gradually coming back and we've just kind of eased all the way back down to those levels again. So the overall, uh, I think, perception of this deal, and if we look at it maybe on this one, it makes a little bit more sense. So here we were, and let me just remove my video feed so you can see what I'm looking at here. Uh, one second. Let's see if that works. There you go. So here you can see a full annotation of, of what we're looking at in the crude market. And this was when we reopened. So if you look at it, where we are, uh, given the fact that where we reopened on Sunday night, we're still you know, at least $2 down from where we were. We kind of consolidated at the moment. I think a lot of that is just waiting for us to come back in. Full market now uh, back in after the Easter break. And it's going to be, uh, I think, a little bit of a day where we'll start to see a bit of more definitive move. You can see we've kind of squeezed in the price here more recently. So a decision needs to be made at this point about where do we take this from here. And, you know, where we were up trading at, you know, only a couple of days ago, there were, remember when there were source comments talking about cuts as large as 20 million? You know, Trump was talking about 15 million when he was tweeting the week before. That was when we hit that high. So those highs on that type of talk, we we're up at 28, 29 dollars, and here we are down at 22 and a half this morning. And it just goes to show, you know, the tracking of how this market's going to react is largely dependent upon uh, how the scene is set, and that forms our expectations. And that's why I felt quite bearish at the time when uh, Trump was coming out with these quite spectacular figures because it's kind of doomed to fail in a way. And, and that's kind of how the markets have taken this. The reference bar was so high that it was almost uh, always going to have a negative kind of price reaction in that sense. But from here, you know, if we do start to break lower, obviously the, the levels I'd be keeping an eye on was that initial opening uh, volatility low that we had on Sunday night at $22. And you can see here I've marked up with some ellipses um, some price points from March and April 2170 would be a target and then that would open up the overall $20 handle again which is obviously so significant being a close to two decade low uh, that we briefly printed going back to the 30th of April but has been a level that generally has held thus far uh, and that's very close proximity obviously only around two and a half dollars away from that at the moment and that does technically open up a firm break of there at any point in the future uh, quite a trapdoor technically where there's not a great deal of support until we get much lower down into the kind of 17 ha or 16 handle which would be the post 9 11 2001 uh, low at that point um, one of the main things as well why people are quite disappointed with this opec deal is, is really the demand destruction that this coronavirus is having on the global economy of course you know as uh, airplanes public transportation and manufacturing activity, everything that requires and backstops the demand for this product has obviously been significantly impacted by COVID-19. And if you look at everyone from uh, research houses to, to funds to uh, energy agencies in regards to the US Energy Department uh, or the EIA, then the change in oil demand for April year to year is significantly more than what OPEC have proposed and what they're cutting. Now, although OPEC overall production, like what we're going to see in the States, should drop off its record levels by a fairly substantial margin, given the fact that now there's lower um, price, it's not cost effective to run these facilities, and so therefore naturally production levels will decrease. That in step with the production cuts, the question is, is that enough to offset this this huge demand shock that we're having. And that's what's keeping people generally quite bearish despite these actions. Another question I had over the weekend and I would say is that, you know, don't don't be fooled that OPEC 
can't change this deal. They can't get more aggressive. They can't go deeper, longer, harder. Absolutely, they will if the price breaks 20 at any point uh, in the days and weeks to come and the price starts to get a run down further. Well, then everyone's going to have to take action. Uh, And that includes probably the de facto kingpin now who's the deal maker, which is Donald Trump. Because if the price does start dropping to those types of levels just mentioned, then that's going to have a massive implications then for the uh, the energy sector in America and then consequently the domino effect being more mass layoffs. Uh, that's going to be incredibly problematic for him to, to manage economically but also politically. So he won't want to let that happen. So I'd say this is an evolving situation, but it's going to be somewhat determined uh, on the price. Whatever the price does, if it comes under pressure, they're going to have to do more at this point. Um, Okay, a few other things to have a look at then. What do the banks think about the deal? Not just about my view. Um, These are a couple of headline things that I saw yesterday. City uh, saying reductions would do little to stem the price route. GS is a historical agreement yet insufficient. And then UBS said the glut of crude will persist through this quarter as producers have already committed this month's shipments to their their customers. So the general Main Street view is that um, this is going to be quite a testing time at the moment to see how oil plays out and that on the balance, a lot of question marks on whether what they've done is enough at this point. Okay, shifting over to another thing to have a talk about. Earnings season uh, is back here. Um, and as per the normal routine, the, the banks really kick things off. So you're going to get JP and, and Wells Fargo ahead of the opening bell today. As I said earlier, you've got 40 S&P 500 companies, four of the Dow 30 components reporting this week. It starts to kind of ramp it up as we go through the next few weeks. Um, earnings for S&P 500 firms are expected to tumble 10.2% in the first quarter compared with the January 1st forecast of a 6.3% rise. So back at the beginning of the year, we we're anticipating that the end of this quarter, you know, the uh, the general earnings for S and P 500 companies would be a positive over six percent, and now it's been um, kind of repriced, if you like, by by Wall Street analysts to it's going to be a negative over ten percent into double digits. So quite a huge turnaround that we've seen over the last um, couple of weeks, in particular. Uh, and that's before the anticipation is that earnings are going to plummet um, nearly 25% in the second quarter. And if you remember, that's when the US economy in itself is expected, according to Goldman's, for example, so it's going to be a, a negative Q2 print of around 35%. Uh, so that's when we'll be right in the, the midst of the worst economic kind of situation, the aftermath of this present lockdown that we're in. Um couple things my my colleague eddie some of you might have seen him he's done a couple of videos on the on the channel before but he's done a really great linkedin post where he's kind of done his essential guide to what to look out for and namely we're looking at banks that they generally are the sector that kicks off earnings and there's a few things he's mentioned here which i'm just going to briefly recap um, but feel free to to read this more in full on his linkedin post uh, but he said larger provisions for credit losses uh, that's one of the main things that he's looking out for in the, the bank's earnings numbers uh, and just generally in earnings in general. If you think about energy specifically, uh, particularly these more smaller independent oil firms in America, they've been particularly squeezed by this low price point. Um, and then retailers, of course, you know, if you think about retail in the US, well, then generally speaking, you know, people, um, they're in lockdown. Uh, They're not able to get to the high street, so they're going to feel the impact, the brunt, as well as airliners. uh, Expected then losses that occur when credit and debt becomes delinquent or is like to default or become unrecoverable. So if you think about banks, uh, credit card and consumer lending businesses, um, they're expected to to take a great hit just on the back of this lockdown and the layoffs that are happening at the moment. Um, the other the other things here, maybe on a slightly more positive sign, is just generally the FICC and equity trading. So just generally the trading divisions of these big investment banks, because of the high degree of, uh, of volatility, is that going to have been good for business? The expectation is yes, but to what degree? And then on the other side, you know, if you think about an investment bank essentially split between uh, the kind of global markets and the advisory capital market side, well, on the investment kind of classic banking side, uh, probably suppressed capital market activity. 
this huge uncertainty about where the economy is heading in future has meant that you know if you think about transactions m and a deals they've basically just stopped as you would as you would imagine it's the most prudent thing to do is not be cutting new deals when you don't know what the economic future holds and only a few weeks months away never mind years away so that's going to be a massive hit to their advisory fee kind of income um, but on the flip side, if you think about things like restructuring divisions, I was talking to a contact at mine who works at Houlihan Loki, which is one of the big kind of US boutique um, advisors in the States. And they were saying that their restructuring business is just unprecedented at the moment. And they're having, actually having to hire in new analysts to help with that demand. And that's likely to, um, to be quite a standout that we'll see with these banking firms and ECM equity capital markets uh, firms frantically issuing secondary secondary or follow-on offerings to raise equity uh, and liquidity and as we've seen with this morning Exxon they've raised 9.5 billion to load up on new cash while debt markets are still open to new deals at the moment uh, and so look, looking to safeguard themselves through kind of hardship that's to come over the coming months. But obviously this comes with investment bank advisory services in order to execute that kind of debt offering. And so they're going to make fees on the back of that. Uh, and then the final point probably to look out for is the lower net interest margins. Uh, you know, flatter yield curve, you know, rates back to historical low levels. Um, and then the final thing I would say is, is about forward guidance what is it then that people are looking at? You know, if you think about, um, if we go back to uh, what Goldman's was saying, which was here, this is what Goldman's was saying yesterday about earnings season. They said stocks have probably bottomed on policy support, despite the likely steady stream of weak earnings reports. They see Q1 earnings season will not represent a major catalyst for equity market performance, and I think I, I kind of kind of agree with that i mean everyone knows that this earnings season is going to be pretty horrific and they know that actually the next one's going to be even worse so actually i think one of the things for me that i'm looking at is is the general forward guidance what do they see the end of the year looking at how significant is that impact going to be uh, we know now is bad but what's the type of shape of recovery that they're anticipating from their profit uh, performance point of view um, that and also be keeping an eye on dividend payments. We've seen in Europe, HSBC, UBS, Credit Suisse halting, cancelling their dividends. Are we going to see that as well uh, in the US uh, to come? Uh, a few other things that I thought was quite interesting. Um, this is looking at the S&P 500 earnings revisions breadth. Uh, so this just goes to show the, the severity of how Wall Street analysts have had to severely um, re or reevaluate and put out fresh estimates of a much more negative position of where we are now from just a few weeks ago, pretty much the worst since then, the financial crisis of 2008. And then one of the other things I was looking at from an earnings perspective uh, this morning was this was a chart here that basically is estimate dispersions. And what that means is how much the highest and lowest per share prediction varies on the average stock and basically, that soared to near record levels that we saw during the financial crisis. Uh, so what this is telling you then is there's been a, an immediate global shock event being coronavirus that's caused analysts to severely uh, review and, and reanalyze and put out fresh, more negative estimates. But the variance of those estimates is the widest it's been since the financial crisis, meaning that you know it's quite a tough thing to try and quantify from an equity analyst point of view at, uh, at this point in time. So again, given that point, I think that does soften the blow a little bit about then uh, the kind of freedom that these numbers have to kind of beat and miss and for it not to really impact sentiment too much. So there's been a lot of hype about earnings is going to be reality hitting home. For me, I think it already has hit home. I don't think they're going to come as a great shock here. And the bar in my mind for corporate earnings season has been set particularly low, meaning then that I think an OK earnings season actually might be received uh, in, in quite a positive way in that respect. Um, if you are interested, uh, I've shown you this before, but this is the, the kind of amplified trading uh, learning portal that we have 
uh, for new traders. And as much as it is a portal, it's a subscription monthly payment where you go through a, a kind of sequence of chapters that teach you the 101 about everything you need to know to analyze and trade financial markets. But what we've been doing is updating a rolling section where Sam North puts out his trade setups every day. But uh, Eddie, the chap I just mentioned who, who did that LinkedIn post, he's done a great video as a guide to earning season, uh, which he's just uploaded to the portal. Um, so exclusive to that, we don't put that sort of stuff out on YouTube, uh, but all of these types of more snippet, we call it macro now research that we do goes onto that portal. Uh, so do check that out. I'll put a link to it in the, in the video. Um, but that is it. No, I think that's enough. Um, obviously for this week, as I said, going all the way back to the calendar, um, today's all about earnings season probably going to just capture a bit of the imagination because it's the first ones and that tends to act as a bellwether then for the rest of the sentiment and the season depending on how some of these first banks come out namely JP and Wells Fargo US retail sales Wednesday Chinese data on Friday uh, and then finally I'll just say it one more time don't forget to subscribe to the channel so I can see you tomorrow but yeah feel free to ask me any questions in the comments and I wish you a good day and a week ahead thanks very much guys